So Maureen, let's start. What the hell is going on? <laughs> I know, you know, I've covered um, nine presidential campaigns in, uh, in high heels and high dudgeon. And uh, this is the wildest because, uh, as Stefan says on Saturday Night Live, it has everything. <laughs> it has Russian hackers, white supremacists, <laughs> dueling Kardashian-like Twitter feuds, dueling federal investigations, small hands, <laughs> and for the first time, the um, Republican nominee has been renounced not by one, but by two candy companies. So first, Skittles, because uh, his son compared Skittles to refugees, and then Tic Tacs, <laughs> I'm sure you all know why. And uh, so anyway, I've, I've seen some crazy things, but this is absolutely the craziest. In fact, I used to call political strategists to help me analyze campaigns, and now I call shrinks. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been really covering Trump ever since he was flirting with presidential politics in the 1990s. So is there anything he has said or done this time round that has really surprised you? Well, it was funny because I had even forgotten how long ago I started covering him. I thought it was, uh, in the book I talk about, you know, going out with him on one of his first presidential forays in 99. And I asked him, why do you think people would vote for you for president? And he replied, because I get big ratings on Larry King. <laughs> and because a lot of guys hit on Melania. So even then, he was, they were dating then, but she was with us. And even then, he had that ego arithmetic. But the funny thing was, I was going over even older stories I did about Trump, and I hadn't realized I interviewed him on the phone in the late 80s when Mikhail Gorbachev came to America. And so Trump went to a meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, and then I called Trump and interviewed him, and he said, well, when I went in, I was really wary about Gorbachev and Russia, but when I came out, I felt differently. So I'm thinking this is the beginning of the Siberian candidate thing, <laughs> because he said he felt differently because the Russians had said to him that they really loved Trump Tower and he should come to Moscow and build hotels. So there was an earlier compliment that got him completely on the side of the Russians that we didn't even know about. But do you think he really wants to be president, or is he deliberately self-destructing? This is, you know, the reporters... Since you've been talking to shrinks, we yeah, want yeah. to know. Well, the reporters at the Times argue about this among ourselves all the time, because maybe you guys will think this is, a, you know, a distinction without a difference, but uh, there are some reporters who think he's deliberately self-destructing, and I think that it's not deliberate, he just, <laughs> he's doing it without realizing. No, that he has certain uh, personality traits having to do with his clinical narcissism that <laughs> causes him to behave in a very destructive way. And it's funny, because when, you know, when I've talked to shrinks about this, I talked to one in San Francisco, because now, you know, I feel like it's the national pastime to analyze Donald Trump. So this San Francisco shrink said that, I said, what's gonna happen next? And she said in the last couple weeks of the campaign, he would revert to some childlike state where the original wound existed. And I said, I don't wanna see that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> but you have actually been phone pals. You. Is his phone talk different than his locker room talk? I wouldn't say we were pals. I went and interviewed him in Trump Tower a, a few times, and I interviewed him on the phone a few times. And, you know, my friends would get mad and they wouldn't read the column when there were interviews, but I still think it's good to talk to people and see what they say. I mean, I felt like I got to ask him a lot of tough questions. I got to ask him if he kept Hitler books by the bed. That was a tough one. In fact, you know, that's a very good uh, 
transition point because you mentioned his early love of Russians and uh, Gorbachev and so is he a Manchurian candidate sent by Bill Clinton to destroy the Republican Party or is he or is he a Siberian candidate controlled by Vladimir Putin and and what is the really the short fingered Bulgarian thinking well <laughs> So there are two theories. One is the one we went over, that he's a Siberian candidate controlled by Putin because he doesn't really have an ideal ideology or issues. He just has his ego, so everything is subjugated to his ego. So if Putin compliments him, then the whole Republican Party has to change its historical stance and <laughs> ideology toward Russia. It's just the craziest thing. So you see them all on TV twisting and turning to try and, and reconcile what Trump has said, which is you know, that he loves Putin with you know, the evil empire stance. So then the other theory, and I think maybe we're all more conspir conspiracy minded because Trump is, so the other theory is that um, he is the Manchurian candidate because Bill Clinton talked to him shortly before he got in the race. And I've been reporting on this, so there are several different versions of this that I've done a magazine piece on. But Bill apparently was very encouraging to him, and he took it as a sign he should jump in. And I've been talking to Bill's you know, aides and friends, and they say, Oh no, you know, Bill is brilliant, but he's not Frank Underwood from House of Cards. <laughs> he couldn't possibly have seen that Trump would destroy the Republican Party and make it easy for Hillary, but I don't know. I think maybe Bill could have. <laughs> but one more thing about Putin, because um, Trump has been all over the map on every issue except Putin. He has unswervingly supported Putin. He's even said now he may want to meet with him before the election. So is there something beyond simply his ego being um, stroked? No, I think Trump, I think that um, his, uh, one of his biographers, Michael D'Antonio, said that Trump's uh, operative characteristic is that he can't stand humiliation, that every rejection is a small death to him. Well, Even then like November on the debate is going stage. to be a lot of fun, right? <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. So he, and that's why, you know, he has this, um, his whole campaign revolves around humiliation, like angry white men who feel humiliated. And when I look back, the first time I actually interviewed him in person was at the Republican convention in 88. And he was saying then that, Everyone wanted him to run, the polls were amazing, but that he, um, he did not want to run, uh, even though if he did run, he would, he would take care of all these countries that were ripping us off. So the alt-right language and Trump's language have always been about America being humiliated and Trump himself can't bear to be humiliated. So in all the debates, Hillary has been working with a team of psychologists. And at first I was dubious about that, but they have really helped her. And she immediately in the first debate went for humiliation. She said to him, you're, you know, you're not such a rich guy. Your father was the rich one, you know, which he hates, that thing that he's not a self-made billionaire. And so you can see him kind of steaming for a little while, and then he'll burst out, as he did with Nasty Woman. You know, so, yeah, so it was very easy for Hillary and the psychologist to figure out how to get him unnerved. And, but even before his recent implosion, he liked to brag that he only got four hours sleep. <laughs> now we're coming into your territory. Come, well, you know, <laughs> he's, such a, he's such an amazing target for my territory because he really exemplifies the worst symptoms of chronic sleep deprivation. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you're up at 3 a.m. tweeting about a former Miss Universe gaining 12 pounds, you know you're not getting enough sleep. Right. <laughs> You know, in fact, you know, Maureen, I want everybody to get more sleep except Donald Trump. <laughs> because the less sleep he gets, the more he's going to be imploding. And uh, I, in the end, I think when um, his, uh, I hope, 
um, out of our public life. Um, if there's got to be one piece of value left, which is that mothers can point to him when their children refuse to go to sleep and say, look, if you don't go to sleep, <laughs> you'll end up like Donald Trump. <laughs>